This is episode 73 of Outlander Cast with Mary and Blake. All the way from Cranston, Rhode Island, welcome to Outlander Cast. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. And welcome, welcome back. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name is Blake, and I'm kind of nervous. I'm kind of nervous, I'm not going to lie. Tell me why, Blake. It's the first of my podcast, Outlander, in, in I think at least maybe a month and a half, two months. It's been a while, my friend, and I have missed it. I've missed sitting across the table from you talking about some of our most favorite characters, some of my favorite book characters, but some of our <laughs> favorite characters on screen. And, you know, we decided to hit hit our return with... Uh, with a, a really cool interview. That's right. We were bringing on Tara Bennett. Now, Tara Bennett, you may not know the name right off the top of your head, although some of you are nerds like me who probably would know the name right off the top of your head. She is the author of The Making of Outlander. And I cannot express to you how great of a conversation we had. I mean, there are some things that obviously we talked about outside of recording. And I got to tell you, we nerded out both mary and myself and tara we nerded out for nearly two hours two hours of a conversation right Mm -hmm. how amazing is that and we talked about all uh, things ranging from outlander to 24 to uh lost battlestar galactica and just making fun of hugh jackman and not making fun of him she was well we actually we we were applauding drooling (laughs) drooling is more like it uh so i i'm actually quite excited about this interview uh specifically because uh it's clearly somebody who really loves outlander and really loved the whole process of making the book the making of outlander uh so you know i'll just leave it to you to decide uh whether or not you like it as well uh my love are you ready to stop wasting everybody's time and uh <laughs> just jump right straight just jump into right the interview in? yes you ready to do it Joining us today is Tara Bennett, a New York Times best-selling author who has written over 20 official movie and TV companion books, including Sons of Anarchy, 24, Firefly, Fringe, as well as The Blacklist in the official Lost Encyclopedia. She is also a U.S. editor for the world's premier sci-fi fantasy publication, SFX Magazine, and has written over a thousand interviews and features for print and online publications, such as Today.com, Blaster, Fandango, Movies.com, and many more. To top it off, she's even an adjunct professor for television and film study classes for Rowan University. But we all know her as the co-author behind everyone's favorite book right now, The Making of Outlander. Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So why don't you start off by giving us a little bit of your background story, particularly how you got into writing? Um, Well, I I came to it in a very circuitous and unexpected way. Um, I was a radio, television, film graduate from Rowan University, which is right outside of Philadelphia, and um, always had intentions of going into the business, and I did. I um, was very lucky to be in um, video and producing. I worked for Comcast as a a live producer uh, for television shows and public affairs programming for almost 10 years. And, um, you know, I love the people that I worked with, but it wasn't, um, exactly why I got into television. I was East coast based and, um, a lot of more of the creative stuff was being done on the West coast. But, um, around that same time I started writing on the side for, um, my, my local, um, branch of, of Comcast where I was doing some film reviews and I was doing some film interviews about people that were doing things in the Philly area and um, that kind of expanded, and I really just loved it. And uh, I've always been a huge film and television nerd. And um, around 2003, I had an opportunity to kind of change lanes with my career. And 
kind of had a decision. Do I want to stay in television or do I want to go into, um, into print and into writing professionally. And, um, uh, I got the opportunity to actually write for the Buffy, the vampire slayer magazine, which was, which nice. was Fox's official magazine for that show, which I adored at the time. And, uh, that was, um, my, my first foray into print. I'd done a lot of online writing and, you know, kind of honing my voice and figuring out, you know, am I any good at this? And, and then, um, and then from there, um, I got into Titan magazines, um, kind of, kind of scroll of, of, of officially licensed magazines that they were doing. So I was writing for Alias and, um, then they started a Lost magazine and Smallville and Charmed and Angel. And I just had this really, really wonderful, um, couple of years where we were, you know, back when people bought magazines <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was <laughs> doing a ton of writing and then that just branched out into other, uh, publications. Like, um, I'm a, a U.S. editor for SFX magazine where I cover a lot of television and film and I've been doing that for a decade and sci-fi magazine and I'm a contributing, um, Oh, editor for blaster.com, which is sci-fi's news portal. And so, um, I've, I've stayed to kind of a lot of nerdy things, um, which is really my MO my entire life. I've just always been into nerdy and genre and geeky kind of stuff. And, uh, the book stuff kind of, um, came as, um, with my relationships with a lot of those licensors and, and, uh, did originally my first my first uh, book was for 24, the, uh, the series with Kiefer Sutherland. Um, and then that branched out into, um, me just doing a lot of, of, um, luckily a lot of books about film, um, making of, and then with my writing partner, who was also one of my editors, uh, back in the day, Paul Terry, we've done, um, the Lost Encyclopedia, Fringe, September's Notebook. Uh, we just did a blacklist book this year. And, um, we're also doing the 30th anniversary of Big Trouble in Little China, which comes out in January. So um, either myself or with my writing partner, I've just really had this strange but really, really wonderful and, and uh, humbling career where I've been able to really um, talk to the people that have made some of my favorite things and tell their stories, which is what I really love to do is to tell the story of storytellers because it's so inspired me in my life. And, and I, uh, uh, I'm one of those believers that everybody has a really cool story inside of what they do. And I like to tell that. So, Tara, I got to tell you, between 24 and Jack Bauer, who I, I really consider to be my spirit animal, um, ah, that's and, awesome. <laughs> and, and, and obviously Fringe and uh, your work with Ron Moore and uh, your work with Joss Whedon and Buffy. Yeah. And I, I think you are our soulmates. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, th I think it sounds like <laughs> it's yeah. We're hitting all of our, our, our of our, our of our geek um, loves at the same place, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. Yeah, I'm I'm. I, I love talking to people that love, you know, the things that, um, that I just, you know, have been really lucky to be able to d dive deep into. And, and it's, um, I know it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's really been amazing. I, I, I couldn't have charted the strange things that I've been allowed to do, but, um, I pinch myself every day being grateful <laughs> that I get to do it. That's for I know. Sure. I mean, I, a lot of the listeners that we have know that I have an unhealthy obsession with lost as well. So the fact that you have written the lost encyclopedia Wikipedia, a book that has not left my nightstand since the day that has come out. Uh, I, That's so I, awesome. All you have to do is tell me that you like Gilmore Girls and like we can be best friends for life. I do. I do. I'm so excited. You know, <laughs> next week we get to get our return to them, oh, right? Yes. How awesome is that? <laughs> oh, yes. As a matter of fact, Mary and I are, are doing a podcast uh, about Gilmore Girls coming up. Actually, it's, it's oh, on right awesome. now. Awesome. Uh, it's called You've Been Gilmore, so you can listen to it anytime you like. Awesome. Yeah, Thanksgiving, Schmanksgiving. It's Gilmore right? Girls coming back. I'm just going to have coffee, ice cream, pie, and Gilmore Girls. That's all I That's need. It. That's all we need. That's life. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are best friends. Okay, from now on. I've We're said, bros. Pinky Th this is it. it. It's now public knowledge. It's a, It's official. We are, we are bros. It's totally official. <laughs> We're Facebook official. How's that sound? <laughs> that's, that's it, exactly. It's not complicated at all. So amidst all these uh, weird, not not weird, but awesome fandoms and all this, all the great nerddom that you have come across, you have now fallen in love with Outlander. How did that yeah. happen? And what what specifically sucked you in to the Outlander fandom and, and the books and even in the, even the TV show as well? Well, was, I, I blame it entirely on my cousin Denise. Um, she and I were were cousins and and um, and best friends. We were younger. We spent our summers together, and um, she actually um, found the books and was um, 
at number way back in the day. Uh, those of you that are millennials are going to look at listen to this podcast and go, huh? But B. Dalton and Walden Books <laughs> back in the day when malls were were, were big um, and people went to those bookstores. That's what they were called. Um, she actually uh, was was at one of Diana's book tour stops and got Voyager signed for me and said specifically, okay, um, I've read the first two books. Um, she had obviously written Voyager, the, the, <clears throat> her third book and said, you know, um, okay, you need to go get the first two books. I went to the library and got them cause you know, I usually trusted her, uh, book recommendations, but they were big books and I was poor and young. <laughs> and so I went to the library and got Outlander and, um, and fell in love with it. And so, you know, reading towards the one that she actually got signed for me. And, um, and so I've been a fan, you know, all the way back since, um, since Voyager came out and, you know, went back, read the first two. And then she and I, you know, would always read the next books and, and, and talk about them. And, um, so I've been a longtime fan of, of what Diana did in the page. And then, um, Obviously, you know, uh, with Ron Moore, I started covering his stuff back with Star Trek and um, Battlestar Galactica. I did a lot of coverage for that show for my various outlets. And um, then I did a, a, a companion book for a documentary called Showrunners, um, which Ron was part of, which is really talking about what the job of, of running a television show is in the modern um, age of, t- of television. And uh, Ron was so gracious and lovely and did book signings with us and the director and a lot of press for that, for that documentary in the book. And, um, and so, uh, it, it, as I mentioned before, I did a blacklist book and Sony has just kind of come back around again to doing publishing for some of their television properties. And when I was doing the blacklist book, um, I took my advantage, you know, um, a lot of, of, uh, opportunity is just putting yourself out there. And so I, I definitely said to the licensor, Hey, you know, if you guys are going to do outlander for anything, um, let me know. Cause, um, I love those books and I love Ron and it's chocolate and peanut butter together and I would be honored to be able to do anything, you know, even consult on, um, if you guys were going to do a concept book or, or something in that world. And, um, I was so lucky that they turned right around and went, Oh yeah. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, sure. And, and I was, uh, and I was in the loop for it, which was awesome. And then, uh, found out last December that, um, uh, got the contract and that I would be um, doing the official companion for seasons one wow, and two. I mean, now you're talking about Star Trek and, and BSG. Ugh, oh yeah. my word! Yeah, so I say know. we all. Ron is, so say we all. So say we all. <laughs> and Ron is uh, an amazing and 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 wonderful guy. He's always been um, really, really um, open and gracious about um, his craft. And I also teach uh, at Rowan University, my alma, alma, my alma mater. I teach a TV writing class. So I've you know taken a lot of what he has told me for interviews and you know over the years and and been able to actually you know bake that into a lot of what I teach my students because he's so gracious about really explaining why he does what he does and how he comes at character and structure and all of that. So we've had a lot of really great conversations that were not for Outlander that have, you know, helped me understand how he writes and why he does what he does as a creative in this industry. And so for me being able to really um, do a making of on this show, which is, you know, what Sony decided to do was great. You know, for me, it was like, great. I get to really, you know, dive into the nitty gritty of um, an adaptation, which, you know, is something that he hasn't really done before. Um, You know, Battlestar Galactica was a revision, but not, you know, in any kind of way trying to uh, word for word, try to reproduce what was done in the seventies with that show. And so, you know, Battlestar was very much him and David Icke, you know, going into a very different, um, allegory, um, of, of what, uh, you know, that show was going to be about. And so Outlander was, you know, kind of a different, um, animal for him and Meryl Davis getting to really know her. She had obviously worked on a lot of his projects before, but this was really her baby in terms of she had loved this and brought it to the table to him. So getting to work with the two of them on this book was really, um, just so easy and so wonderful. And they were, um, you know, it's just really, really great when people want to tell you the process of, of why they do what they do. And, um, and, and then everybody just opened themselves up. You know, I did more than 70 interviews. Some of those included repeated interviews for this, uh, for this book. And, um, for me, it's, you know, like it's, 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 it's no difficulty at all to be able to just sit there and dive into how do you, make something this complicated this far away, basically creating a, a brand new infrastructure in Scotland because, um, 
they don't have a Hollywood or like a Georgia based kind of um, production facility there, you know, to, to kind of start from grassroots to bring the people in to work on a show with this kind of ambition and scale um, and be able to kind of chart that and talk about it from their, their voices. You know, they're the people making it. And that's what I really wanted to do with this book is just really been, um, it's just really been wonderful. So I, I know we are going to talk about Diana. I mean, how, how could we not talk about Diana, but I, sure. I need to talk about Ron first. Because yeah. um, I, I love him almost as much as I love Damon Lindelof. So, um, so tell me what you you, t- you mentioned that you really use Ron's uh, work and his uh, ideas uh, for your teaching your course. And what were some of the mm-hmm. things in, in you know in light of Outlander uh, that you that he brought to the table that you felt were really special for the book? Like what was it, like you have to capture his voice, but you also have to capture your voice as well. So what? Mm-hmm. Is like what specifically did Ron provide for you that you thought, oh, nobody else got this. I need to get this in the book. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it, here's the interesting thing is that this is a really well covered show. And, you know, you've got, you know, places like Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and other places, you know, great podcasts like you guys do, um, you know, and they've made themselves accessible. So there, there is a lot of material out there, which is daunting for me because um, whenever I do one of these kinds of books, um, my first goal is I'm a fan. I wouldn't want to buy something that I feel like is a regurgitation of everything that I could get out there for free, you know? Um, and it's, you know, not cheap to, to, to decide to buy one of these books. And so my name on these books means, you know, I, I put a lot of time and effort into going, how do I make it special? And, you know, I, I, I will, you know, fight as much as I possibly can with publishers and licensors going like, let's just make a product that feels like it's worthy of a fandom and that it's going to be worthwhile for them. And so, you know, going back to your point, you know, what what can I go to that Ron hasn't said before or hasn't, you know, and there'll be some repetition um, just because, you know, their talking points are their talking points. They can't make up new things, you know, on on a subject. But what I really tried to do was um listen to a ton of, um, interviews, read interviews, and then also watch all the featurettes that they featured, um, you know, with extra scenes and stuff on, on their DVD, um, presentations and make sure that I, at least if I could try to ask something differently, um, or, or expound on something or, or listen to an answer and go off in a direction and, and, and have them, um, you know, explain something in a little more detail that maybe they haven't explained somewhere else. That was, that was my mandate, you know, for me to try to do that as much as possible. And I felt like, um, with Ron and with Merrill, they, you know, they really let me understand the infrastructure of what they had to do. Um, the, the kind of, um, transatlantic kind of process of, you know, making the show in, in Scotland, but also having their home base based in Pasadena, California and their post-production and how, what that meant to them and being able to be present and what they needed to do so that there could be somewhere all the time being representative of what the writer's room wanted versus what the needs of the show and what Scotland (laughs) will eat you to eat you alive on any given day, pending the weather and the, and the needs of the locations um, and the changes that you have to make on the drop of a dime just because of, of, of those kinds of, um, rough, um, locale kind of, um, necessities, um, that really helped me a whole lot. And then, you know, it was also a lot of the adaptation process of understanding, you know, you've got this seminal work, you know, from Diana that has had 25 plus years of fandom imagining in it, in their brains for that long. Um, how do you possibly live up to those standards and how do you not disappoint? And, I think we had some really great conversations about making sure that that didn't throw them off their game of the story they wanted to tell. And I think one of the interesting things that the fandom sometimes um, gets a little upset about, which is, you know, that it, it the, the fandom sees – Claire and Jamie is is equal in the books as you know the kind of the anchor pr- protagonist of those books but a TV show is a little different and that and that Ron very much wanted to make um Claire you know the 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 anchor of the series and you know you have to kind of do that in television to have a point of view so that the audience can kind of gravitate around it but I think he's done some really smart things too with in season one, allowing us to have an episode where it was Jamie's point of view and allowing to kind of creep in as the series has moved along, um, for us to be able to still get Jamie's perspective, but it's very much, um, Claire's, uh, point of view, Claire's, um, 
you know, perspective as we move through the story. And a lot of that made a lot of sense to me structurally and, uh, and, you know, explained to me and under understanding why, you know, what you have to do to make a TV show rather than when you make a book. And, you know, the great thing about Diana is Diana's never, um, with any of her books stuck to a format, you know, there's, she is just, um, thrown stuff out there and her way of telling her stories have always been one of the best surprises about cracking open one of those books, but that doesn't translate to TV. You know, you have to, um, figure out then how to tell the story in a way that, you know, isn't breaking all the rules that Diana did in her book, which was awesome, but that allows a, an audience to understand and follow a narrative. And so I think really in seasons one and two, you know, Ron was able to break that down and hopefully I was able to translate that, um, in, in the big portions about, um, adaptation and, and how they've chosen to make the show and the decisions that they've made that hopefully explain some things to, um, book lovers. But then also if you're just somebody that's a fan of television, um, can understand the process that they chose to take in, a, in adapting the books into, um, this medium. I think you did a great job. I mean, gosh, I, I, being a book reader and a show watcher, I've had a blast looking through your book. And for Blake, who's just been a show watcher, it's it's exciting because there's things that it still is like a whole new world. Uh, show watchers, you know, they're like Jon Snow. They know nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Worlds collide. Yes, yes. So, you know, you're talking about Ron and Marilyn. I want to know what was your relationship with the Outlander creative team like? Um, it was, you know, honestly, they were super, super generous, um, you know, the best case scenario that we wanted for the book was for me to be able to go out to, um, Scotland. Um, and I'll do that for some projects, you know, I'll go out on the set and that will be a big part of where I, um, get a lot of the interviews, but because of the, the late, um, kind of closure of the contracts with this book, um, they weren't back into production until the middle of January of this year. And then they were on their last blocks for the entire show for season two, which meant they had six weeks of production left. It's high winter in Scotland. You're also, um, desperately trying to get done all of the things that you need to get done. And, um, I started to see the writing on the wall about end of January that, um, it was looking ugly in terms of, um, me going there and maybe being more of an invasive presence than needed to be when they were in such a, a really high stakes period of shooting for them. Um, the weather was terrible um, earlier this year for them, you know, knee deep mud, no joke, like literally trying to get, you know, gear and equipment and crew into locations where they were literally stuck in the mud or would have to sit and wait for weather delays for several hours um, and then have to suddenly shoot when you got a window, a literal window of sunshine. Um, they were they were really up against the elements. And so we made a call about the second week of February to just not have me go out there because, you know, I'm the last thing that they want to do while they're trying to get all of that other stuff done. So what I ended up doing was I, I went out to the writer's room in California and did a ton of interviews with the writers um, from the show, really be, got to sit down and really talk with um, each one of them about um, how they do what they do, how they came to the show, what their relationship with the books were, you know, if they were longtime fans, if they were new to it, how they then interpreted, you know, the 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 original material and, and then, you know, how they were, what they wanted to faithfully adapt, you know, what were some of the special things for them as writers that they attached themselves to in the books um, and that they wanted to portray, which was really, really wonderful. And then everybody that worked as an actor or a crew person, I just did a... Um, phone interviews. So basically from middle of February until about mm, April, um, last interview with Ron being May, um, I was doing anywhere from, you know, anywhere from two to seven interviews a wow. day, um, uh, for the show, um, you know, working on, um, Scottish time. So would get up at six or seven and just start doing interviews back to back to back to back, um, until I finished for the day, then go through the process of going through transcripts and cleaning them up and figuring out what I needed to do and then writing. And so it was pretty intense. Um, and you know, when I had have issues, you know, I'd go out to Sony and watch episodes that were completed. Um, I watched up to, uh, Preston pans, um, before I started writing just so that I had the cuts and the scripts in my head, what I could visually do. Um, but you know, knowing that I was still talking to people while they were shooting things, um, 
would ended up, uh, you know, going back to some of the writers or the directors and saying, hey, you know, in the final cut, was this changed or was this different? And, um, you know, had a really wonderful open um, pipeline to them so that make sure that everything was accurate and that things that were decision made, you know, in the edit process or, or along the way um, was as accurate as possible and we could get, you know, um, changes and, and commentary about that up to the final lock of copy. So, so um, who was your favorite to work with and who did you really have to dive deep in with to get what you needed in terms of the interview processes? Like I, I and, and I guess another question too would be obviously, you know, going to Scotland uh, would, would have been really beneficial. Is there anything, is there anything that you felt like you missed out on because you, you didn't go to Scotland? Um, you know, uh, I would say if I had never done any of these kinds of books before, um, I would have missed it. Uh, it's always cool to get the culture of a show and to see the depth and breadth of scope of what, what they do. Um, but I've done 25 of these books. Um, I was in television production and I know, um, hopefully one of the things that is, is, uh, is a hallmark of what I do is that I used to work in the business. And so that translates into how I, I can talk with knowledge about what they do and why they do it. And, um, you know, can speak to the language of those that are working on a show. So, um, while it's nice to see that material, um, I also, um, it, nothing was a surprise to me in terms of when they were mentioning things or how many people they work on the show or the depth and breadth of what their process was. Even with me not being there, I knew, um, you know, what questions to ask and I, the research to know, OK, this is how this happens. And then certainly if someone explains something that was out of the ordinary about what they do, particularly with the show, I follow up with that and get an explanation. They work on a block system, which is actually not very um, um, different than what they did on 24, which is uh, basically a fortnight. They work two weeks um, doing two episodes and then pickups and anything else that they might need because they um have to shoot the show based on locations and actors, um, not always on um, when a consecutive episode would happen. So um, it's very, uh, to me, it's very similar to how other shows operate as well. So for me, no, I, I mean, it's, it'd be great. Um, I don't know if, if being in, um, in Scotland in the winter is something that I would have missed because I'm not a cold weather person. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I think maybe a uh, um, summer in Scotland would have been my, nicer. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, um, um, regret, you know, the, the weather. And I certainly don't regret being in any kind of way an imposition on the crew. And that's always my first mm -hmm. thought whenever I'm working on a project is how do I make uh, the smallest footprint possible so that nobody feels like I'm, I'm uh, a problem in their day when they've got a show to make, you know, the show was ultimately the most important thing for them to do. But, um, you know, uh, I, you know, if this, if this, this book has been successful so far, you know, the hope is, is that if, um, Sony and, and, uh, and, and, um, stars and, um, random house would like to do another book, then, you know, and however they choose to do it, if they do individual seasons or another double season kind of book that I would go out the next time, which would be great. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't, you know, um, hold that as, you know, an opportunity that will never happen again. You never know things happen, but, um, you know, that, that could still happen in the future. But, um, you know, in terms of interviews, I honestly, I, it's like, it seems like a cop out, but everybody that was so generous with their time, you know, from Matt Roberts, you know, he's such a fun interview. He's, um, a straight shooter and we had great conversations about adaptation and, you know, he shoots a lot of second unit out there. So he brings a different visual perspective along with a writing perspective and a producing perspective. I mean, he, he was, um, he was an Outlander fan, um, that actually, you know, was even before Merrill, you know, introduced Merrill to it. So, you know, that's a surprising, you know, kind of element and, and knowing how deeply he's been involved, um, with, with the fandom and, and appreciating the show as being a potential, um, at an adaptable property for a very long time. Um, Meryl, you know, getting to know her more was really, really wonderful. Sam and Kate, uh, are just really, really lovely people. They are, you know, one and two on the call sheet, which means they are always <laughs> working and yet they were extraordinarily gracious in making multiple times to talk to me so that we could have a whole overview of completed season to talk about, you know, they could have easily have said, okay, I've done my interview with you and, you know, I'm, I've got other press to do. I'm not going to talk to you again, but they didn't, you know, they made extra time and that extra time, you know, really helped make the book feel complete. So, you know, they were really wonderful. Um, you know, I, I think everybody, um, uh, it was, you know, I, uh, 
there, there were challenges in terms of uh, a lot of the French actors, you know, this big French. And so I had a friend of mine at one point do a Skype with me so he could interpret the, 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 uh, the, the French for me so that we could do the actual interview. So a lot of it was just really fun. And, and, uh, you know, if you figure out the challenge in the moment for whatever works best for the person that you're talking to, um, and in, and in the end you, you make it work out. So it was, it was, uh, each, each book is its own, is, is different. And this one definitely had its particular challenges, but honestly, everybody was really a joy to talk to. You know, getting back to, uh, the creative staff and, and how the show works, I, I've always found that fascinating, um, because it's cause I'm a huge nerd and I just want to know how things are made and how things are created. Mm. So what did you notice? You know, you, you did talk about having a small footprint and being in Pasadena. What did you notice about the creative staff in terms of how they create the show, like how they interact with each other? Or how do they problem solve? Uh, what's that process like from an outsider's perspective, especially in light of other shows that you've done work like this on? Yeah, you know, I really found it fascinating the way that they um, embraced their writer's room Um and the debate, there was always that very healthy debate. You know, Ron specifically wanted to staff the room with with writers that knew the books and that writers that did not know the books. Obviously, everybody, once they were hired, were told, you know, read the books. But, you know, there's a big difference when you come into a room with a, a long-term um, uh, history with the books and, you know, imagining what things would look like and imagining, you know, as a fan that comes into the room versus somebody that reads it and knows now that you're going to have to adapt it. And there's a, you know, a, a less uh, personalized um, kind of uh, approach to how you would adapt um, that, that piece. And so, you know, Ira Bear was definitely the person in the room that was a, not a book reader, came in and was looking at it from the perspective of um, probably, you know, Blake, and that would appeal to you the most, which was, I- I'm coming into this as someone that's never read these books, so how would I make this into a TV show? And also um, really adhering to the, um, the, the difficult stuff that Diana wrote, you know, the Wentworth Prison stuff and more of the... Um, the more violent and emotionally, um, challenging material, Ira really embraced that. Um, and you know, it was difficult for some of the writers to kind of wrap their heads around, well, how would we portray that? Or how would we do that? Even Ron admits it going like, you know, I, I wasn't sure how to really do some of the things that you can read on the page that Diana does. And how do you put that into a television show? And then you had other writers like Tony, um, and, and, Anne, who, you know, really fell in love with certain aspects of the story that they really hoped that they got a chance to tell. And so they would, they really did have a lot of great, um, back and forth and they pushed each other on what's important and what's not important and what was being, um, you know, servicing the fandom that's been waiting for 25 plus years to see this versus somebody that's just walking into this as a television show and making it coherent for them and not having the weight of all of these important moments that they have to touchstone, but still making them feel important for an audience that isn't going to know. And then will embrace those as important moments because they feel organically like they need to be important in the show. So it was, um, really cool to hear that, you know, that they had plenty of spats about what was important, what wasn't. They worked through it. You know, they figured it out. Uh, they rewrote, they, um, replaced things. And I think a lot of Outlander book fandom, you know, um, finds it confusing sometimes that you'll take words that one character said and put them in the voices of other, you know, characters mouths or, you know, change when they said something to someplace else. I know a lot of that comes from that creative back and forth in the room where they all know things that are incredibly important to the fandom and to the characters. They don't want to lose them, but they, in a medium as television, may need to find a life somewhere else. And so that was, I think, really fascinating to, you know, hear the, uh, the difficulties of several people in a room trying to, you know, kind of bring their point across as to what they thought was most important for the show, for the characters and for the fandom, and then finding the right balance for that. So you, there's a, there's some transition going on right now. Uh, like Ira has, is not going to be with the show mm-hmm. anymore and they're bringing on a whole bunch of new writers. Um, yeah. did you ever get a chance to spend more time with Ira and be like, listen, what's your, what's your final coda? What, what's the, what's the final words that you want to get in about Outlander? Or, uh, did you ever get a chance to speak to the new writers or so, something to that effect? 
Not yet. Not yet. Um, you know, we're doing a signing in uh, Pasadena at Vroman's, um, which is a bookstore that's not that far from where the writer's uh, office is. And um, we, we have it open right now to whoever can participate. You know, December 12th is when it's going to be. And that's always dependent on who's writing, who's on a show, who's off, who gets to go with their family and stuff. So we may actually, um, we have Tony, um, Tony Graffia and, and um, Kenny uh, Ron Moore, definitely that are going to be there, but we may have some others that might be able to show up too. And that might be an opportunity where we'll get to have some of those conversations. Um, and they've all made themselves available, you know, to having those conversations if we, um, you know, want to include that, in, you know, somewhere down the line or in the future. Um, there was no bad blood about it. It's, it's literally about, um, the, the, the pickup for three and four is a longer, um, commitment um, then some writers, especially the, some writers that are in development for other things, um, can do. And so sometimes it's really a logistical problem as to whether people can stay on something for as long as, as, as a, a two year commitment is really almost like a three year commitment in terms of pre-production writing and then moving forward. They don't really get time off, you know, in between seasons, they have to keep writing so that they can keep a machine like this going so that they can have episodes that aren't that far apart for the audience to watch. And it's a very, um, intensive post-production kind of show. So those are really the issues, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's really logistics of, um, who's available, who can be available and who has other things that they need to do. But yeah, there's been no bad blood about people that have left the show. It's really been more logistical and other, and other things that they had, they had working, but, um, yeah, hopefully, um, you know, uh, either in my coverage where I, you know, still cover the show for some of the other outlets that I write about, um, I'll be able to, you know, maybe get some of those comments some down, somewhere down the pike, um, you know, about, the coda and, and the things that they, their last thoughts about leaving the show. A lot of moving pieces in this writer's room. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so, definitely. It is. So Richard Kahan had said that there is the outlanders writer's Bible. It's exactly how Ron is positioning the adaptation of his storyline and pertinent facts for writers mm -hmm. to write about. Did you get to see this Bible or did you get to talk about this Bible in great detail? <laughs> did you get to touch it? <laughs> um, I, I've, I've seen the Bible. I didn't need to look at it per se um, because uh, we weren't reproducing it. Um, and Bo Ron did a Bible for Battlestar Galactica, which I do have, and I use that for my class. Um, so it shows a really great example of how he thinks about really um, positioning everything. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times studios really want the showrunners to develop a Bible so they feel more confident about where the foundation and blueprint for a show is going to be so that when something as big and as epic as this is, and Diana's books again are not, um, uh, they aren't easily and linearly adaptable just because she comes at the storytelling from such a nonlinear perspective, especially as the stories proceed. Um, Studios just like to know, do you have a grasp on that <laughs> <laughs> so that we don't see a big mess when it comes down the pike when, you know, of how you would, you know, kind of lay that out for us and what that would mean in terms of budgetary responses, what it would mean in terms of where we're going to be shooting at locales. Um, Diana's books are incredibly epic in terms of where they go in terms of, uh, uh, of just landscapes. So um, a Bible is incredibly important for studios and for showrunners to be, art be able to articulate to studios. Here's where we'll go with it. Here's how we would break down certain things. And here are what some of the core things that we will be adapting that are important to us. And so, um, uh, yeah, they, they definitely, you know, constructed a lot of that, but yet they keep a lot of it organic too. So that, you know, um, when they lose actors here and there, um, you know, uh, if they, somebody has an, another, um, commitment to do something and they lose people that they're going to be able to have to like figure it out, you know, and the, like Willie was a great example that Ira told me, you know, that he was supposed to be a bit much bigger part of season two, but that actor was not, um, he is recurring. So, you know, you can't keep Willie, um, sitting in the sidelines to, to work on a show when someone offers him, you know, a contract to work on something else. So he, um, couldn't come back because he took another gig and that meant they had to make a lot of changes in the show about, um, what characters are going to be doing certain things that they had already appropriated. And so that's a great example of you can have a Bible, but things are going to change and you sometimes just can't have what you intended, um, episodic to episodic, um, 
and you have to make some adjustments. And so there's always space for that, even though there's a Bible that exists. Okay, so we keep using this term Bible, and I'm not going to lie. I'm picturing it to be like a document in National Treasure where it's underneath <laughs> glass and you have to have gloves. Does it, does it, is it a Google Doc? Is it bound in leather? Like, does it bite back like the books in Harry Potter? Tell me what this outlander Bible is. How cool would that be, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> it would be like, you know, like it's, a, it's like, like wrapped in a kilt (laughs) and you have to unzip it. It would be really awesome. Um, uh, what's under the binder? Um, yeah, uh, um, it's no, (laughs) it's it's, uh, like Battlestar Galactica was a PDF. Um, (laughs) it's like, Oh, that's sad. Um, uh, lost was 12 binders, you know, so white binders that were in Greg nation's office. Um, this is, um, basically, you know, same thing. It's kind of digitally, um, augmented, uh, the writer's assistants will use it as a reference. We're in the writer's room. So as they're working on things and working on the board, if somebody kind of, you know, goes, Hey, um, where do we kind of appropriate that? Wait, can we do that logically? Um, and someone will look in the Bible and go like, okay, here's where this occurred or here, this was, this was referenced and no, we couldn't do this here because then that would, you know, be a continuity problem with such and such. So it's mostly an active document that, um, you know, they go and use as a reference material to make sure that their timelines all work out and that they don't move too far, you know, because obviously the show has also created a lot of new material, um, augmented Frank's story, um, added some other characters, um, changed characters around a little bit. They just have to make sure that they stay within parameters that don't create, um, a distress later on. Uh, with things that will happen in the future with the books and that also don't create a problem within the world that they've already created. So it's more of a functional document than something kind of cool. But um, it it certainly helps in terms of of, um, keeping everybody on their toes um, in terms of not forgetting core things that are easily forgotten when you're working with a show with this kind of a deep mythology. All book readers are like drooling at the idea of figuring out Leary in this Bible right now. Blake, <laughs> hear yeah, but, No, uh, no, I, I'm listening. Yes. I can't have earmuffs. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'll let you take over, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you talked a lot about um, the Bible and, and, and the creative team. And, and when you're talking about all those things, you have to take the words from the creative team like Ron or the writers or mm-hmm. even actors or even someone like Bear McCreary. They have yeah. their own technical speak. They have their own Hollywood, sp- Hollywood speak. Of course, idiots mm-hmm. like me and, and you know normal people out in the world have no idea what they're talking about because they're talking about breaking <laughs> episodes and writing them and, and doing pickups and second shoots. And what is it like to translate all that into like – layman's terms and did you ever do you ever fi- feel like oh man i need to break this down even further for just the regular average joe i i hope i do okay with that you know because i i am um, i'm very comfortable in the vernacular of of a lot of those jobs um and 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 so for me i i do have to try and remember often um is this go? Is this a language that is going above the average uh, person's understanding? So what I'll do is I will um, uh, give uh, some sections to people that are, are friends of mine that um, uh, that one. No, they're never supposed to talk about anything <laughs> that I let them see. Then number two, um, you know, it's only it's always just a section, a paragraph or two, and just say, do you understand um, the way that I have either explained in between somebody's language to clarify what a sentence meant or what a quote meant? Um, is there something that would help uh, in terms of letting people um, get clarity on uh, what someone's trying to articulate? And that helps me a whole lot so that somebody goes, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that, what do they, what, <laughs> you know, when they come back to me and go, mm, yeah, explain that more. Then I'll go, okay, let me bring it down another level. Um, my editors are great with that. And, um, and Speyer, who, um, was my editor on this, um, we, you know, we had a copywriter that, um, didn't know television. So the copywriter, you know, came back with a lot of stuff going, I don't know what this means. I don't understand this. And so when I'd see that, I go, okay, that means I need to clarify because that's the audience I'm writing for. I'm writing for somebody that goes, I don't know this language. And then that's my job to make that um, cl- clearer, smoother, um, and more articulated. So that was definitely a process um, to be able to bridge that gap between the working professional language and then the person that just is interpreting, you know, um, 
what they're seeing and what they're what they're getting from the creatives on the show. Did you ever have an experience where, you know, you're you're talking to somebody and they're going through all of this and obviously you probably know what they're talking about, but then they get into a conversation with another writer or another actor and you start hearing things like, "Oh, maybe I should take a step back from this. Maybe this is like a maybe an argument I shouldn't be hearing." Uh Oh yeah, I've done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not asking you uh who, but can you tell me like have you do you have like a story or something that you, you heard something that you probably shouldn't have. You don't have to name names, but uh, just just an ex- uh, uh, an example of something that you would have heard that you could translate into the book, but not make it seem so visceral the way that you've seen it. Um, that's a really good question because I consider myself to be a steward of the of the show um, and the license whenever I work on a project. You know, um, I think the reason that I've been able, I've been lucky enough to do um, as many of these projects and work in as many um, confidential, confidential projects that I have is because um, I'm very respectful of the creative process. Um, I hear plenty of things because of the access that I may be given um, that aren't meant for the outside world. It's meant for the creative process of the show, and the creative process of the show is very sacred. You know, there um, people may go through all kinds of levels of um, working through a final solution for a a problem on a show. And sometimes it's contentious because, um, everybody's fighting for the best thing. And, you know, that, that sometimes will come into a lot of conversation and a lot of conflict as to how to get there and what's the right way to do it. And, um, I've been on sets where I've seen those kinds of things, where I've heard those kinds of arguments, um, where I've definitely been privy to, um, a lot of things that if I would have talked about it in the outside world, that would have one been a breach of the, of, of what my job is to be a steward of the show. And, you know, I take it really seriously to keep all of that stuff, um, um, where it belongs, which is on the set, you know, and that's, um, and, uh, you know, when I'm working on a, on a project where I might be writing for a magazine and I'm not doing something for the license, I'm talking about a show or I'm, I'm, you know, breaking down why something's happening in an industry or something, you know, that's talking about a a bigger picture or themes or something. Um, you know, that's where that belongs, where I can talk about things that are, you know, my perspective or my analysis of what's happening in a business. But whenever I'm working for a licensed project, um, I I have an NDA, which is the (laughs) non-disclosure agreement, um, which I live by. And then number two, you know, it's, um, I'd much rather, um, always feel that whoever I'm working with showrunners, actors, all the people that, um, I'm going to be touching to work on these kinds of projects, whether it's in person or phone calls that they feel like it is a very safe space with me, um, that they can be, um, that they can be as frank as, as much as they'd like to be. And that, um, I'm, I'm working to tell their story in the best light possible, you know, that, um, I'm not going after some kind of, kind of sorted, Oh, here's what it's really like. Um, it, it's it, it's as dysfunctional as anybody's family may be. Every show is exactly that same way. You know, it's you go and have Thanksgiving and you want to rip a cousin's eye out by the end of the night. But at the end of the day, you still love them. You just need a little space from them. It's the same thing when you're working on a TV show. These people work, you know, 14 hour days with each other and crazy situations on any show, um, not just Outlander. And you know, the longer they're with each other, the more they become a family and they have the, you know, contentious days and then the smooth, smooth as silk days. And it's, uh, you know, I walk in and and jump in and out of that. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, telling the story of, of the, of the final product is really what I'm trying to do. And, you know, the stuff that I'm privy to that might be even more, you know, confidential or, or off the record, you know, I respect that as well too. And, you know, that infuses, um, the, you know, the, the tone of the narrative that I'll, I'll talk about sometimes, you know, because a lot of people are very frank, you know, I'm going to going back to 24, the sixth season was very, um, contentious with the fans and the critics. And, uh, Howard Gordon, who was the showrunner, was very honest with me about a lot of the things that didn't go right with that season. And that's reflected in the narrative of the book because, you know, you can't, um, I'm, I'm not making books to kind of whitewash the process. I'm trying to give insight into why they made the choices that they made. And then at the end of the day, you know, if you watch the show, you can make your own decision about whether or not it was successful, but at least you'll have some of the answers as to why they did what they did. So that's always my approach, trying to, you know, get the real life into it. And, uh, you know, not just have it be kind of 
the sunny, perfect version of it. It's, you know, the more frank an interview that I get, they themselves are talking about the warts and all. And I think, you know, that, that, that's, um, you know, if I, if, if you were to read anything that I wrote and just think everything was like perfect and everyone loves each other every single day with puppies and rainbows, <laughs> then that would be a, that would be an incorrect reflection of the real world. And, um, I think, you know, I try to infuse that in, in an honest way, um, without, you know, um, going into specifics that, you know, aren't necessary because it just, it is what it is in terms of, of everyday personal, um, dynamics. Speaking of the much maligned season six of 24, by the way, I felt, mm. I felt that the first four episodes were some of the best t- television has ever produced, I know. which, which is really right? an irony seeing how it turned out, uh, toward in, in the I middle, know. Was, you know, yeah, it was like, mm, what happened? I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people were just like, what, what the hell are you talking about 24? So, uh, but I'm actually proud of that book because boy, did I get every everybody to really talk about the things that, de- that weren't right with that, you know, like I, they, everybody was honest in, in hindsight, you know, some people were defensive about some things going, well, this is, you know, we didn't think it would be accepted this way, you know, or received this way, but here's where we were coming from when we made that decision. And at least you get the clarity of that. But yeah, I lie. Season six was not a loved season, but I really loved that book because I feel like it was a book that everybody was pretty honest about the problems and, you know, also trying to maintain a show after season five, which was so brilliant. Um, and then trying to keep the headwind of that going when it's a really rough show to keep going in terms of plotting and repeating yourself and staying within the constraints of, of, you know, one hour, every episode. Um, I, I think if anybody that likes television wants to, um, know how difficult it can be that season six book for me was one that was, um, that kind of really, um, put it out there as to some of the issues. Right. Um, right. So I like, which is so cool. you obviously captured the narrative of the first four episodes being awesome and like probably like the, the last five or six episodes being really good too. So with that in mind, what's, what do you think the narrative is for this book for Outlander? Uh, you, again, you, you, you want to, ca- you want to capture an honest narrative. So going mm-hmm. from something like 24 season six to now this book, what narrative are you trying to capture and what do you think you captured? Um, I think what I captured, especially with season one, was the intensity of starting up a show of this kind of ambition, of this kind of um, this kind of expectation. I mean, you've got thirty, you know, almost thirty years of expectation of fans who have imagined these people, these characters, um, how it would look how those moments would play out. I mean, you basically have the theater of the mind with people, you know, millions of fans who have read these books, read them over and over again. Imagine trying to mount a project that's ever going to make anybody happy. (laughs) (laughs) And, and I think um, what I really wanted to do with season one was talk about how, how fraught that was in terms of um, the excitement and the challenge and the daunting aspect of that. Um, And then also, you know, really expressing to fans how much people like Meryl and Ron and and Terry Dresbeck and uh, John Gary Steele, who were longtime fans, wanted to bring their fandom into the show, you know, to make the things that they'd imagined as well um, into reality on the screen at at the utmost uh, production design and of the utmost um, production value and the utmost acting, you know, how they went into the casting of it and how, you know, deep they sought to find the right people for these roles so that, you know, if you don't buy the actors that are playing it, then you don't buy the series pretty much, you know, it's, it's a high concept idea that if you don't, um, really like the people that are playing Jamie and Claire and the surrounding clansmen and the rest of the supporting characters that, um, if none of that works, uh, then the show doesn't work. So how all the puzzle pieces really needed to be put together and how weighted and conscientious they were about the entire process, all of those things and how difficult it was to mount something, um, that's, you know, technically based in two countries um, 7,000 miles away, what that meant. And then for season two, it was, you know, the acceptance of the show and then really trying to push the storytelling into maybe a more opulent place, especially with the Parisian settings, really being able to kind of go to town with some of the, you know, the, the, the visuals that they really, um, mounted for the show. And then, um, you know, the, the difficulties of kind of really figuring out how to, take Diana's narrative and exactly what it did in terms of ambition and time jumping and character 
and make that work um, in a way that uh, is very difficult. You know, uh, it, it, most shows don't have to deal with, you know, aging characters and a very wide arc of time. People don't even touch that kind of stuff because they know that it's, you know, almost like it's, it's a show killer. You know, people fall in love with the way people look at this time or this age range. But that's what they that's what they embarked upon when they when they said, yes, we're going to do this show. We're going to do these books. And then the process of really kind of trying to explain that to an audience that loves these things or that just watched the show and goes like, hmm, yeah, those are a lot of, those are tough things to kind of try to figure out how to wrap your head around. And here's, here's why they chose to do the things that they did. You know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm noticing a little bit of a pattern here. You talk about how most shows don't even want to touch that stuff. Yet all the shows that you write about are like all about that crap. The, the time <laughs> jumps, right. flash You're sideways, right. you know, the right. time travel. I, I, Man, you got it knocked down. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. So it's funny, you know. I like complicated things. <laughs> <laughs> so you've talked about, you know, being able to talk to the writers and doing all of these different interviews and um, being being able to have insight into the process. I wanted to know about how you took it from step A to step B, meaning the book. How did you? What did you do with all of these these interviews and all of this information? What did? What was the process for you like? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that part of it is, is a mountain. And, um, the good thing is I've done it enough to know that, um, there's a process. There's, uh, I do work well, kind of type a part of me that likes to structure things. And then the creative side of me, they work in tandem, which is great. Um, I like to have order. I like Excel sheets sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so basically, uh, Random House hadn't done a companion guide uh, for a very long time. A lot of the major publishers out there have kind of got out of the business of doing companion guides. But because Random House Penguin is Diana's company, they, of course, um, had the publishing rights for this as well. And so Anne and I, uh, Anne Speyer, my editor, again, um, had a lot of conversations about um, what the book should be. And I, I gave a lot of suggestions on what a flat plan, and that's basically, uh, if you would imagine, a flow chart of what the book would be, uh, spread being two pages right next to each other, what all of the spreads would be, um, how many spreads we'd put for each section. Um, you know, we do have a page count. A page count is... Um, you know, kind of the, 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 the disappointing part about making a published book is that, you know, on the internet, you can go on and on and on. And that's awesome. But you know, a book, uh, the more pages you do, and once you get past certain pages, you start going into different price points and you want to make sure that it's, um, a viable price point for a fandom, you know, that they aren't going to sit there and go, what, how much do you want me to spend for this? <laughs> and, and, you know, for me, it's okay. If we try to get as many pages as we possibly can. Um, how many of those will be, you know, um, visual spreads, how much of them are going to be content spreads, how much can we, you know, ram into a page as much as we possibly can so that you do feel like you're getting something out of the ordinary. So there were a lot of conversations back and forth as to, um, what the sections would be. Then we, you know, find out, you know, who can participate, um, who wants to participate, um, what we can fill into sections, what we think are, um, areas that haven't necessarily been covered by mainstream press. You know, that's, um, a big part of what I wanted to do was to see, you know, Sam and Kate and, you know, the core actors, you know, they get their postmortem interviews and they get, you know, tons of coverage, but, you know, um, somebody like an armorer or somebody that, you know, um, is, uh, you know, a, a makeup artist or somebody that, you know, is, is making props or, um, you know, being able to get a different kind of interview out of Terry Dresback about what she's done with her costuming. All of those things were important for me. Um, and, you know, I, I pressed very hard to make sure that uh, we did something different. And so m my big pitch for the book was that instead of us, you know, I did not want to have uh, so, you know, episode synopsis and a recap of, you know, you can get that anywhere for free, you know, great podcasts do it, great websites do it. Um, you don't need that when you're going to buy a book because you can get that for free everywhere else. And so my goal was let's make every episode the story of the writers and then the directors. Those are the two people that are going to have the biggest impact on the story um, and between, you know, what is written in a room and then what is portrayed from that script on location, um, between the two of them, you really kind of have the visuals of, of what the end product is and the decision making from the room in, in California to what they're doing in Scotland on set. And so um, they agreed to do that. And that's really the, the spine of all of the episodic takes. And then 
Uh, we, we gave spotlights to as many of the actors as we possibly could. Those were that were available that wanted to participate, um, tried to find a lot of the, um, behind the scenes teams and departments, um, to support, you know, talking about what they do so that you got some insight into how they, they brought this world to life in a contemporary setting in, in Scotland and yet make it look, you know, like it's, um, it's, it's era appropriate. And then, um, and then, you know, uh, Ann and I would go through all the photography to try to find photography that was different. You know, I was uh, really important for me to try to find as many phot photographs as possible that weren't already used in um, the main publicity photography that we've seen all over the place on the Internet. So um, season one was more limited, but season two, we got about 4,000 pictures for every episode. So uh, Ann and I would go through and pick out a lot of the ones that we thought um, we're going to show part of the story that was different than you would have seen on the stars website or, um, on the, um, you know, any of the other, um, websites that had, you know, um, uh, key art for, for episodic, um, stories or features. And then, um, I went in and cross checked and when we pretty much had done a first layout, went in and, and went onto the stars website and, and circled everything that was already on the website. So if we could replace it, we would, um, you know, some of them are just great ph photographs and we didn't want to lose them because they are great, even if you'd seen them before. But whenever we could put something new in or a different shot for something, we tried to do that as much as possible, just so that when you get the book, you don't feel like um, you've kind of been there, done that. And so that was a lot of the process. And then, you know, um, I had so many transcripts um, coming in from each of the interviews that I would... Um, basically go through every transcript as soon as I got them and just start separating materials to the episodes that they belonged in, the spotlights that they belonged in, um, what was different than someone else said it. And then, you know, just start chopping through and go like, well, maybe Sam told that story different, or I haven't heard that story before about that episode. I'll leave that one in. I'll take that one out from somebody else that talks about it. If someone wasn't represented, in a certain way or wasn't in the book enough, I'd use their story instead. So it was a whole lot of just trying to check and balance everything to make sure that I felt like everybody had a voice um, as much as possible. Is there a story you can recall off the top of your head that you thought like, yeah, this this was a really special thing that I heard that Sam said that I got a hold of um, and it, that makes your book so different from everybody else's? Oh, well, that's a good question. I, I think some of the things that Sam really talked about in terms of story motivation for me were really interesting. He talked about some of the Wentworth stuff um, in a way that I thought was a little different than he talked about it in other places. Um, uh, we had to cut a little bit of that from the book um, just for space. But he, um, yeah, he just really talked about, you know, the mental process that he had to go through. Um, and, you know, we also talked about, you know, trying in season two to make Jamie feel as real as possible and, um, find a space where he could feel a little angry at Claire and still make Jamie who Jamie is. And I thought that was really great because, you know, he was trying very hard to make Jamie as real as possible and, um, not perfect per se, you know, a lot of the fandom and, you know, we love Jamie for, for all the wonderful things that he is, but Sam really wants to show him as a full bodied person that can get angry and petulant and upset, you know, about being put in a very difficult position by his wife. And so, um, he was very frank about a lot of that stuff. And I, and I, I think that that added to some insight that hopefully maybe people hadn't gotten somewhere else. Speaking of Frank, a lot of my, a lot of the listeners know that I am totally team Frank and I, yeah. I have a, I have a slight <laughs> man crush on Tobias Menzies. Oh, he's he so is great. an amazing actor. Is there something like he, he said to you too, like in the same vein of, 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 of Sam where like, you caught something and you're like, Oh, I need to, I need to delve down on this. Yeah. You know, I really tried with Tobias cause he's, um, you know, I read a lot of his prior interviews that he'd done and I could see where he would pivot away from things that he didn't really want, you know, that, that people focused on. So I tried to talk about some different things, um, about his thoughts about what, how Frank felt about Claire, about, um, especially in season two about, um, you know, I think a lot of people like to look at Frank as a villain, but I think the show has kind of shown him as somebody that really does love Claire very much and um, that he's in a tragic situation, too, of accepting um, this woman that's come back with somebody else's child and still um, 
trying to make it work and knowing that he's not loved as much as the person that she fell in love with, you know, that in those weird in between years. And so I think we had some really good conversations about that, which I thought were, um, different than when he talked about with some other people and, uh, presided, you know, provided some insight into, um, you know, what I enjoy about Frank too, is that he is a well-rounded character, um, in the show sometimes, uh, a little bit, um, you know, I, I think, for me, it's never about competition. It's about wanting to see characters that all feel like they're real and they come off the page. Um, and on the show as somebody that I can see and understand their perspective. And I think that they've done that really well with Frank on the show. And, um, I do, I do love Tobias's take on him, um, and making, I'm really excited to see what they'll end up doing and adding to that in season three, you know, um, to get to see those interim years, uh, of where they were together, um, that I think, Tobias is going to do an excellent job and the writers will do an excellent job in, in just kind of fleshing him out even more. Now, now you've had a lot of time to reflect on your book. People have been reading it and loving it. Everyone I've talked to who owns it is just over the moon about the book. So oh. I've been wondering, are there any questions of the actors or maybe the creative team that you've thought of now, you know, after the book is done, after everyone has it, that you wish you could go back and ask? Oh, gosh, that's the writer's bane of our existence <laughs> is that we are never done. If we could sit there and tinker with it until the cows come home and ask more questions, I would, I wish I had an extra, you know, thousand words for every actor too, because, you know, for as much as is in the book, I still have tons of material that I didn't put in the book because there's just not enough pages, you know, to be able to, um, to be able to put all of that material in. And, uh, you know, I have great, stories from some of the directors about, you know, extra little moments, things that, you know, I, man, I can't even tell you my poor editor, how much <laughs> I tried to cram into this book. I'm like, do we need that picture? I don't think we need that picture. Do we need it? No, let's put this in. Cause you, if you notice with the book, there are those box outs, um, that have extra material from, you know, actors or other people on the set talking about, um, an episode once it's gotten past the writer and the director's commentary. Um, and I had tons of that. I had tons and we tried to save as much as possible. Um, but there's still, there's just, there was just a lot of material, um, that I had that, uh, you know, I c clearly could have augmented even more, um, insight and, and material, but tried very much to, to, to go towards the things that I felt like hadn't been seen before. And my editor also was very aware and, you know, was looking and going like, well, I didn't know that story. So why don't we keep this one rather than that one? Um, and so it was just, you know, it's, it's, um, that horrible, um, little phrase, you know, killing your children. You have to just sit there sometimes <laughs> and go, <laughs> I wish it was in there. But, um, yeah, no, there's always, um, there's always things that I would, I would still, I would still love to dig into, but, you know, um, like I say, I, I still cover the show for other outlets, um, where it's just where I can ask those questions. And then if I'm lucky enough and, you know, um, I can't thank the fans enough for how wonderful, wonderful they've been about reviewing the book and being so kind and supportive on social media with their questions and letting me know that, um, that it isn't a turkey of a book, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, at the end of the day, after you spend, you know, uh, for me, it was the most intensive period for me was pretty much from February until May, um, writing the book and, you know, just a lot of really horrific days where the world did not see me for days upon days upon <laughs> days. Um, and just hoping that at the end of the day that, you know, I'm, I'm doing right by the fandom. I'm doing right by the show. That's ultimately at the end of the day, what I want. And you know, that, that a book that goes out with my name on it, um, and especially with my name on it and Diana's name on it, that she doesn't sit there and, you know, look at it and go, what is this, <laughs> you know, mess that you've made about my show. You know, I was incredibly important for me to not disappoint her and to not disappoint Ron Merrill and um, those that worked on the show, you know, that I was trying to tell their story right. And then the fans, you know, that again, that I didn't feel like there was some kind of cash grab book that they felt like they were actually getting something that was worthwhile at the end of the day. And, you know, at the end of the day, I know I could always do more and maybe something a little better. And I'll always see those kinds of things. But, um, um, you know, I, I hopefully I get to, uh, if I get the opportunity to, to do another one, you know, I take that feedback and, and um, you know, bake that into what I do for the next project or if we get to do another Outlander book. So we like to do, uh, when, we're, when the interviews are closing, we like to do uh, um, a rapid fire section uh, of questions. Okay. So uh, I'll begin it. Uh, tell me, Diana, what is she like? Is she just amazing? Is she funny? Is she kind of quirky? What's she like? 
She's amazing. Yeah. She's really wonderful. I, I, w- I just had the, um, I had the honor last week of getting to do a book signing with her in Arizona in, in her domain. And, you know, to see how that she's cultivated a fandom of 30 years and how gracious she is. And yet Diana is so loved because Diana's Diana, you know, she, she will say it like she, she feels it, you know, she's, um, she will, she's, a um, she doesn't, um, prance around things. She's a straight shooter and she's got a great sense of humor. She is, um, talks about things, uh, forthrightly and she is, um, she knows who she is as an artist and also as somebody that's cultivated her fandom. And it's, I was just really honored to be able to sit next to it for a couple of hours and, see how gracious she is to that fandom and to also, you know, just see how people really adore her and how much an impact, um, her stories and characters have made on people. That's, um, that's pretty amazing to just be witness of. And so, um, I've been very, very grateful to have, to be in her orbit just a little bit for this project. Start to finish. How long does it take to put together a book of this nature? Um, it really, it's different for every project. Um, you know, the fringe book took a year Um, uh, this project was, uh, say January until May. So it was more accelerated so that we could get the book out by October. Um, the big trouble in little China book, which is a 30th anniversary, which is a legacy book. Um, we worked on from pretty much, um, I would say December until June. So, um, and that one's coming out in January. So, um, I would say anywhere from best case scenario, a year to sometimes it can be as brutal as four months. What's your favorite collaboration with Ron? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say this, I would say this because, you know, um, a lot of what I've done with him in the past was coverage of things or, you know, we were having interviews um, that I didn't have to have like the kind of constant kind of return. This one allowed me, um, cause I covered the show from season one and then got the book project. We were really consistent with our relationship on this. And so, um, I would say this one just because it allowed consistency and a, um, a back and forth where we didn't have to kind of restart all the time. It was, it was, we, we just, checked in with each other. And that was really great. Did you get to sit in with Bear during any of the creative music process? No, I wish, I wish, I wish we didn't, it didn't align um, that I was able to head over while he was working on any of that. But that is a dream. Yes. That's yes. a dream. So somewhere down the line, <laughs> I would, I would love to do that. That would be amazing. So you've done a ton of these compa- companion books. How would you rate the Outlander fans' uh, passion or the numbers of fans or the knowledge of the fans uh, in in light of all of the other fandoms that you have done, like let's say 24 or, you know, my favorite Lost, how would you rate the Outlander community? Uh, I would rate it, I have an intimidation factor. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I rate it. Lost had a huge intimidation factor because that fandom, um, that fandom was interesting because everybody watched the show with a different lens you know, some people watched it for character. Some people watched it because they wanted answers about polar bears and smoke monsters. Some people watched it for um, mythology. Um, you know, they wanted uh, all these things answered. Um, and so y- it was always scary because you knew that y- you weren't going to be servicing everybody, you know, so you tried as much as you could, but you knew, you kind of knew that you weren't going to be pleasing everybody. Um, and so that's where that intimidation factor was. This was a high one. Islander for me, I felt the heavy, heavy weight of, you know, almost 30 years of fandom, um, that wanted answers <laughs> for a lot of things that they either didn't understand in terms of the adaptation or wanted more insight into. And then also people, um, that just were watching it as a show and that would just want to know, well, oh, uh, they d- oh, I didn't know that they did that there or they were, you know, just informational. So I feel like I was servicing two two very different fandoms and needed to make sure that I was doing um, both a service in this book. Um, and uh, and so there was a lot riding on that. I felt I felt the weight of that while I was writing it quite a bit. What's a funny anecdote that you didn't put in the book that you encountered during making the book? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, mm, oh gosh, my, my recall with all of the stories that I got, I'm trying to think, um, Where are those binders. Yeah. Did you get a chance to see oh, Sam God. naked in the river? Let, oh, let's, let's, let's just ask. I wish, I wish I, I wish I had gotten any of those, any of those visuals, which would be awesome. Um, 
I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one only because um, nothing's coming back immediately. And that's probably my, my day quill <laughs> working on my brain right now. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> I'll come back to you with an answer on that by email and then we can put it up on nice. your <laughs> Who was the favorite, who was your you favorite go. director to talk to and work with? Oh, um, I think Metin Houston was awesome. Um, although all of them were really, really wonderful, but Metin was, um, just really, really lovely. He actually even provided me some storyboards, um, that we weren't able to use for some legal reasons, um, for this book. But, um, you know, sometimes I'd have, uh, something that I would need a little bit of augmentation on and I could just email him and he would just, I'd ask a small question expecting two or three sentences and he'd give me a paragraph that was just wonderful and illuminated, illuminated something else that, um, just made the book better. So, um, but again, a lot of the directors were really provided a lot of that, that background. And I just, we just had a nice back and forth between the two of What's us. What's the hottest book you've ever had to write? Was it the lost encyclopedia or I know you talked about intimidation factors, but like the, the most amount of information that you've ever had it was, is outlander it. No outlander was a lot easier than other books I've done. Um, I would say lost was, the most meticulously written Paul and I had a lot of challenges. I mean, that book was down to the pronoun being correct <laughs> in terms of how specific we had to be with the mythology and the language of that book, because, you know, that fandom would blog, you know, pages and pages of theories after every episode. And so if you used a word that could possibly be in intimating something else, everybody would go, you know, you, you couldn't, you had to be concrete and he had to be very specific, and that one was rough. Lost was really tough. Fringe had a lot of challenges with it. Um, that was more behind the scenes. Uh, um, we're both extraordinarily proud of that book, but that was a rough one. That was a rough one to land, and um, extremely happy with the with the end result of that book. But um, yeah, those two, those two, um, we wrote you know both of those while they were finishing the shows, and so that was. Um, that was challenging. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, bad I, robot I did that. Didn't I did that with either. <laughs> yeah. No. They were actually. They were really helpful. It's both of those shows uh, allowed us to have incredible amount of ac access. Uh, but we came into those. I mean, Lost was just that every episode they were adding more things. When you're doing an encyclopedia, you're like, oh, great. There's more things to add every week. You know. So every script was new character, new prop, new thing that you know you needed to add to the the eventual page count. And then also again conceptualizing the. Um, the flash sideways at the end of that book and trying to, you know, kind of articulate that to an audience was, was, um, was challenging. Um, fringe, uh, they were, you know, writing the end of that show, there was alternate timelines for that. And that was just a really, um, for us, uh, that whole book was our baby in terms of how it was laid out and all the different alternate timelines and the way it was written in the character, um, voice of September. So there was a lot of, um, things that we had to get right. And then also, making sure with Joel Wyman, who was the showrunner at the very end of that series, that the book had the message that the show wanted to have, so much so that they put it into the series, um, which was uh, a huge moment for Paul and I to have actually a book that we wrote in the show, um, which was, you know, the, the best stamp of approval that we could ever have imagined um, for that. But it was, you know, obviously, like you said, a lot of moving parts to make sure that something like that happened, a lot of changes and, and, and doing things um, and Sons of Anarchy was rough too, in that um, I was writing that while they were finishing that show too. So I think anything where I'm, where they're actively trying to bring a show in for a landing, and I'm trying to like have this little Cessna next to it, <laughs> landing with it, and not get in its way and fall into the engine and blow up everything is always. Um, it just it just uh, puts a lot more um, stress on 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 me to make sure that we're all doing everything that's servicing the, the project right and that doesn't um that it doesn't in any way undercut you know what the final product is did you ever have a situation during an interview where you were like oh man i wish i hadn't done or said that um you know sometimes you don't always have chemistry with an interview subject you know i'm definitely won't say that every inter you know some interviews are awesome and that move along really wonderfully and then some people you just don't click with you know that they just um they just don't they're maybe not in the right headspace for an interview or they don't um click with the kind of approach that you're trying to do i i pride myself in very much trying to um just try to have a conversation and, you know, um, 
have a great back and forth. And, you know, just like everybody in real life, some people um, just don't, they're not up for it. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes an interview is like, well, that could have gone better. <laughs> and, you know, you just try to, you hope that it, that you didn't do something to add to it. Maybe it was just um, a bad day and you got scheduled on a bad day um, or that, you know, you know, not everybody's going to love you. <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, I just hope that I get the material that I can to turn it into something. So, well, uh, that, that is all you have survived the rapid fire. You have survived the personal questions. You have survived speaking to us for almost an I hour. I was just going to say she survived talking to oh, Mary. It was Blake. so much fun. I'm so, I hopefully I didn't keep you guys on way longer than I'm sorry. I, if I got too, oh no, yes. God, no, we, this, this is, is our date night. This is what we do. We po- people ask us like, how'd you guys get into podcasting? We are like, we have babies. We don't get to do anything anymore. Oh, this is how we have fun. <laughs> this is how you get out in the world. I feel you. I feel you. Well, it was so much fun to talk to you guys, though. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. Tara, again, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for for spending so much time and talking and have such insightful questions. And I, I, you know, every every single person that supports this book, I can't thank you enough. And so for you guys to give me an hour and a half and to be able to go so deep dive into it, I thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate it. Of course. And Tara, if anyone wants to find out more about you, where should they head on the internet? Um, I am on Twitter um, at Tara D. Bennett, um, all one word. Um, That's the best place to find me. Uh, You'll find me talking about book stuff and retweeting, um, you know, TV stuff and writing stuff and all that kind of good thing. And um, on Instagram as well, um, uh, Tara D. Bennett. Um, but I'm I'm not on that as much. Instagram is a little less uh, less frequent, and uh, that's pretty much the places to find me. Um, uh, and uh, I do have a website, which is tarabennett.net. So um, I have links to my books there, and it's going through a little bit of an upgrade right now. And uh, you know, um, I don't blog very often, but I definitely have links to a lot of the things that I do in terms of the outlets that I write for. And do you have any book signings or appearances in the very near future? Yes, we are doing one for the Outlander book at Romans in Pasadena on December the 12th at 7 p.m. It's going to be with Ron Moore. And it's definitely going to be with Ann Kenny and Tony Graffia. And uh, we may have more of the writers, again, depending on their schedules. Um, but definitely, as of right now, depending any, you know, when you're making a TV show, the TV show is the most important thing. So um, pending any cancellations or, or shifts, um, they plan to be there. And we'll talk about the book. We'll talk a little bit about season three. And then we'll sign books for everybody, which will be really exciting. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Goodness gracious. <laughs> talk about, like I said it earlier, nerding out, man. Just totally that. nerding out. And for those of you who have not yet picked up a copy of The Making of Outlander, I would highly recommend that you put it on your holiday gift wish list mm-hmm. because it's awesome. It is a really good size whether you keep it on your coffee table or you just keep it by your bedside. The pictures are amazing. The stories that Tara was able to get and share are outstanding. And if you do have a copy, maybe it would be a good idea to gift someone a copy because <laughs> anyone who likes Outlander, even if they're not book book fans, if they've just watched the show, are going to get a lot out of this book. And it's a decent price point too. It you is. know, like they even she even talked about that in the interview. Like they designed it for people who love the show, who love the book, and also realize that hey, you know, things are a little tough, and mm-hmm. we want to make sure that everybody is has the opportunity to get a chance to read the book. That's it. I, I, I don't see any reason why you can't buy it. Can't ask for much more. <laughs> so that, of course, wraps up the interview with Tara. And I wanted to let you guys know that our next episode of Outlander Cast is going to be another interview, actually. Right. And we are starting a new series on Outlander Cast called Gone Lander. Gone Lander? What does that mean, Mary? What does it even mean? <laughs> it means people who were on Outlander but are now gone from the show. So they're gone landers, guys. And there's a whole bunch of people who we love who are no longer coming back. That's right. Maybe they're just not in the story. or Maybe their character died. So (laughs) we're starting off with one of the most touching characters from season two. He melted your heart and he gave a lot of you hair envy. We're talking about Ross, who was best friends with Kim Cade. You know, they had that touching, touching segment where... They willed each other, you know, if I die, you get this, right. you're going to take care of my wife, all this great stuff. My gosh, it brought me to so much tears. And I think this kind of surprised a lot of people at it, how much this character, both of those characters kind of impacted the Outlander fandom. I, yeah. I mean, it may be as a result of the fact that they were kind of intertwined with Rupert and Angus. 
But also, I give so much credit to those actors. So our right. interview was with Scott Kyle, who played Ross. Mm-hmm. And after speaking with him, gosh, what an endearing and just lovable guy. He right. really was so sweet and so funny. And he like that's how I would feel. If he was dressed in a kilt back in time, he would be the same guy that I was talking to, I feel like, uh, just on the phone. So... Check it out, our next episode, starting the Gone Lander series, and hopefully we'll have a lot more Gone Landers lined up for you. I'll tell you what. Those of you who are in our Facebook group, the Outlander Cast Clan Gathering, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because so many of the questions from today's interview with Tara were driven by you. That's right. I posted the question. I let our clan members know, hey, guess what? We're interviewing Tara. And so many of you came up with amazing, insightful questions, and they really helped make this interview possible. So I wanted to say thank you and also encourage those of you who have not joined the clan gathering to join because right. your question might be something that we get to use in our future Gone Lander interviews. I also want to call out the uh, editor-in-chief of the Outlander cast blog, Ashley Crawley. Uh, also, our senior writers like Denise Stewart and Ann Gavin and Holly, Holly Richter White with all the amazing questions that they actually helped us come up with uh, for this interview to give you guys, the listeners, the best opportunity and the best information that, you know, not a, you know Tara talked about it in her interview with us. Like She's like, I didn't want to talk about the same crap that everybody else did. I wanted hey, to find something new. Crap. You know, But you know what I mean? I know what I mean. I know, I know. I, we, we wanted to make sure that we just didn't ask the same questions that everybody else did. We wanted to find a unique vibe and feeling, a, a unique narrative as uh, as Tara talked about uh, to this interview, and it wouldn't have been possible without those guys. So, as always, thank you. Thank you so much to the writers. And if you have not yet gone to see the Atlanta Cast blog, I'm telling you, it is the one-stop shop. Amen. The, the, the premier, seriously, and I'm not saying this to toot our own horn. It's the premier Outlander uh, website, I because feel like. it's not just recaps. It's not just, here's the same news that you read it on 50 other sites. It is so much more. Th- these writers go in-depth, give you news stories about the new cast, give you great insight into themes and into characters and into situations that really help fill these lonely hours of Droughtlander. <laughs> so you can visit it by going to outlandercastblog.com. And I wanted to also give a little um, boost for... Our Patreon website. So yep. we used to have patreon.com slash Tomah Media. We hadn't really been plugging it because Blake and I rebranded. And we've decided to have a pre- Patreon account specifically for Outlander Cast because there's just so much content, so many great things that we want to share with our patrons of the show that you know, we just needed to have our own Patreon account for it. So Patreon, if you don't know what it is, is a way to support our podcast and a way to support us. Um, generally, when Blake and I podcast, we have to hire a babysitter. <laughs> like there's one here right now, and there was one when we interviewed Tara. And um, it's really it. We love podcasting. It's one of our favorite hobbies, but we gotta pay our bills a little bit. So by Patreon supporting us by even like a dollar a month or whatever. It helps out. A little goes a long way. And those of you who have been Patreons, I thank you. I thank you so much. And feel free to switch to the new Outlander Cast account. You can find that at Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash Outlander Cast. Or you can just click on our support tab at Outlandercast dot com. Another thing I wanted to call out too is the fact that we also had uh, 10, I, I think maybe 13 personal questions with Tara Bennett. Uh, things like her favorite movie and all that other stuff. Uh, and you can find that actually at outlandercastblog.com only. It'll be written. It's exclusive. It's exclusive Outlander Cast blog content. So please be sure, I'd say within the next few days after this has, uh, this has aired, please go there and find out. And also one other thing too, check out our brandy new, brand, brand new. spanking new website, yes. maryandblake.co. If you just cannot get enough of Mary and Blake, <laughs> you will have everything that we do there, including the Outlander Cast blog, uh, Outlander Cast, all of our other podcasts that we do, and all the blogs that we do, including Mary's very famous and awesome, just really great website, tallmomtinybaby.com. Well, thanks. So if you want an inside look at what we do every single day, go to maryandblake.co. And you're sticking around to the end because you love us. So guess what? We have a new podcast called You've Been Gilmore, <laughs> just in time for the new release of Gilmore Girls. So I'm just putting that out there. Check You've Been Gilmore in iTunes or on the web and you will find us. So until next time, ladies and gents, 
I'm Mary Larson. My name's Blake. And you've been listening to Outlander Cast. Outlander Cast.